There's no one like you Mountains tremble when you speak I'm listening A whisper changes everything Almighty God There's no one like you No one like you Shabbat Shalom! Welcome! Passover 2024. I'm going to introduce you to your MC for the weekend, but if everyone could please stand for just a moment. I know many of you have been traveling near and far, maybe as far as Singapore, for all I know. We'll find out here in just a minute. How many of you are glad to be here? Well, I'm glad that you are here. And the crazy part is, is we still have hundreds more people that aren't here. So they're on their way. You guys are the blessed ones. You're here. And I just want to let you know, there are tons of seats available in the front row. So let me just give you a real heads up. If I ever go to a conference, you will see me right here. This is where I'm at. And uh, I came here to this event, uh, a men's retreat, in fact, with the ministry that is in charge of this, this whole compound called Encounter Encounter Ministries, amazing people, and uh, and I sat right here with 1,150 men that filled this entire place, and I wanted front row seats to whatever God was going to do. And I will tell you, it's very simple. It, I believe, not it's not even a belief; it's a fact that when you are in in the in the ancient Israelite wilderness, the t where do you think the presence of God was most felt? In the Holy of Holies. In the tabernacle, outer court, and then it began to wane as you go out into the millions of people two miles down the road. So the closer you get to Jerusalem, ladies and gentlemen, that's where you want to be. It's more bright. So the reason why I'm saying that is because I want you to test me on this. If you are a back row person, nothing wrong with back row, but I encourage you at some point to make your way to the front during worship 
you will feel a difference. There is something about the frequency of being in the mix and closer to the mix. Amen? Amen. Test me on this. All right. Let me introduce you to a new friend of mine. He is a gentleman that I met last year for the very first time at Sukkot. I'll let, you tell, I'll let him tell you his story, but would you please give it up for your MC for the weekend, Joseph Dalton. You're all standing and clapping, and this is new for me. So how cool that you're clapping for me. You don't even know me yet. But thank you so much. That was awesome. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Passover 2024. This is going to be a great weekend. If you want to experience God this weekend, you will. If you want to see things uh, from a new biblical perspective, you will. But um, if you're, you know, this guy in the back row, kind of like I was at Sukkot, took me a couple days, then... uh, You might not get everything that God has for you. So you're in the right place. This ministry is doing some amazing things. For those of you guys that have never experienced uh, a feast celebration, raise your hand. If this is your absolute first time honoring one of the seven feasts, that's awesome. Let's give them a hand. I was in your exact position last fall. I did not know what to expect. I grew up a Christian, and I love God, and I want to raise uh, my boys to do the same, my wife and I. So last fall, I came in really not knowing what to expect, and what I will tell you is that Sukkot is eight days, and it is absolutely spirit-filled. I watched uh, my nephew, Jack. (laughs) Where is Jack? There's Jack. Um, I watched my nephew, Jack be uh, delivered from something demonic, and that was honestly, and I've been a Christian since I can remember, so 40 years, uh, it was the most powerful God experience I've ever seen, and so since then, um, I've been staying in touch with Pastor Jim and supporting this ministry. It's it's really doing things that are changing families, changing legacies, uh, breaking chains of generational curses, addiction. It's much more than just a feast. But when you draw close to the Father and you know the Father's voice, he will speak to you and he will show you things that he intended for us thousands of years ago. So you're in the right place. We're so excited you guys are here. If you traveled more than 500 miles, raise your hand. That's me too. More than 1,000 1000 miles, raise your hand. That's me. Is anybody from another country here? Raise your hand. Where, Where are you guys from? Australia. Good eye, mate. Welcome. That's amazing. That's a long flight, yes? Wow, Australia. Does anybody have Australia beat? Same? Do you guys know each other? You don't know each other. All right, get up and go sit over there. Seriously. No, I'm just kidding. All right, here we go. So another question I have is, who is the largest family here? If you have more than 15 people, you know, like cousins, in-laws, all that, raise your hand if you have more than 15 people in a group. How many you got? Nice and loud. How many? Whatever they said, amen. All right. The point is, uh, I was here in Sukkot with 24, 24 people last time. There we go. They're standing. All right, anybody? Related to Jack Schmidt, stand up. Friends, family. There we go. That's my family. That's my wife. Kirsten, wave. Everybody knows you now. She was doing registration. All right, we will get to the announcements. Don't worry. I know you guys are excited for that. Another question I have is, did anybody experience resistance getting here? Did anything come up that almost stopped you from coming? I'm going to share, isn't it funny that when you take action toward God the Father, a lot of times there's obstacles. A lot of times there's things that come up. People get sick. It's, we know, it's a spiritual war. Every day is a spiritual war. So I experienced some resistance getting here. On Wednesday night, 
I was attending my son's baseball game, and the foul ball went over the fence, and I don't know why, I think the 12-year-old boy in me just came alive, and I sprinted to get that foul ball, and I'm pretty fast. Um, and there was a concrete thing right there, and I don't know who put it there, but I did not see it. So I sprinted to about right there, and I was looking toward that foul ball, and I tripped so hard that I fell about eight or ten feet further on my wrists, my knees, and my toe. And my wife heard me fall, and her and the other ten adults that turned around and saw me, um, they had a perfect blend of compassion and hysterically laughing at me. So I didn't feel any pain for like 30 seconds, and then I was like, I don't think this is good. My toe feels like it's broken, and I don't know if I can walk. But I'm here, right? So give God praise because I know it's not easy to do these things, but you guys made it a priority, and so that's amazing. We're all in this together. So one thing I want to do is I want to ask every father to stand up. If you are a father, please stand up. I am too a father. I have four boys, and I want to be the best. To do that, I need to know my father. And I want to applaud you guys and honor you guys for being here as fathers because let's give it up for all the fathers. Something that you may already know or maybe you need to hear it again is that you are the gatekeeper for your family. And there is a spiritual attack on our children right now in the world, in society, in our culture, in the music, in the movies, in everywhere you turn. We have, everything is artificial, right? Even food is being made artificial. And we know the truth, right? This ministry is called Passion for Truth. So you fathers, if you develop that passion for truth, Truth is not negotiable. Truth is not debatable. Truth is truth. And that's what this ministry is about. When you guys lead your family to that truth, you are leading them generationally. And it starts with us. We have to be aware that there is an attack on our children. There's an attack on us. If the enemy can get a hold of us and distract us and give us fear and give us limiting beliefs or addiction, then he has access to your children. And that's something I've learned last fall through Craig Hill and digging into the Bible more. So I'm taking fatherhood to a whole new level. I'm being a lot more intentional. And that's my call to you guys is to lead your family closer to the father. So give it up for these dads. It's amazing. Thank you. You can sit down. So we're going to get into, for an event like this, to go on smoothly there has to be structure. There has to be some rules. Rules is like a five-letter word that people don't like, especially my wife. She doesn't like rules. But um, she did drive 75 only on the way here, so good job, babe. Anyway, um, so I'm going to go through some of these things. We really need to listen to these announcements and really take them to heart because we want everybody to be safe. We want everybody to have a good time. Uh, but before I do that, my biggest encouragement to you guys this weekend is to not be shy, right? Don't just stay in your little circle of the couple people that you know. Introduce yourself to an unfamiliar face. I know I met Steve Penny. He's here somewhere. I met him last fall. Um, my kids have, they're some, like four of them are sitting right up here, I think. Raise your hand if you're my kid. One, two, okay, there's like seven, no. That's my kids' friends. Anyway, speaking of my kids' friends, one of the things that impressed me about Sukkot in the fall is the quality of the families that come to these events. If you're truly seeking the depths of the Bible and intimacy with the Father, you're going to attract some pretty cool people, all different types of backgrounds. We got Australia here and different journeys. People are in different places in their faith. But what I noticed is that the families were so like-minded, loving, accepting, non-judgmental, 
And it was just a really amazing experience last fall. So I know we have the same dynamic in the people that are here today. So make sure you meet some new people today. My kids met all these other kids in the fall at the Sukkot event. And the reason I know they made great connections is because James is 11. He's right here. And he doesn't have a phone yet. So he proceeded to put all of his friends' numbers in my phone. And I'm getting texts from all you guys very, very often. But I love it because they made some really quality friendships. So it's really cool to see. And there's, they've been talking about this for three months coming back. So first thing we're going to talk about with the announcements is we're going to introduce to you guys our security team. We have Tommy and Steven. Are you guys there? Raise your hand. In the backpack right at that table. These guys are committed to helping the campground stay safe at night, during the day. And in your trifold, they tell me that nobody reads the trifold. So let's prove them wrong and Find some time to read that trifold. It's got some great information in there. But in the trifold is a phone number. If you guys see something that's off, if you see a threat or danger or need to report an injury or something like that, you can text or call that number in the trifold at the bottom, and that will get you to the security team, and that also works for medical. So if there's a medical emergency, find that number in the trifold and get a hold of them. Uh, we do have quiet hours. Uh, we can't sit out at the bonfire till 6 a.m., but um, the quiet hours start at 11 p.m. That doesn't mean you need to go to your tent or your lodge. It just means some people want to go to bed by 11. And so we're going to keep the noise to a minimum. Uh, teenagers, your curfew is 9.30, okay? Repeat it after me, 9.30. My son's smiling because he knows I'm lying. Um, it was either going to be midnight or 1 in the morning, and... Pastor Jim is the one that said it's going to be 1 a.m. Give it up for Pastor Jim. So we do need the teenagers and children back with their families by 1 a.m. Now, there is a couple rules with that, teenagers. That is not the time for you to wander off. One guy, one girl, walk by the lake. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. So... Seriously, stay in groups, stay safe, be cool, don't do anything crazy. So 1 a.m. teen curfew. Uh, parents of small children, we have to emphasize this. We love family camp. We love, I have my niece here, she's 11 weeks, 12 weeks, and she's tiny. And we have kids all the way up to 17 years old. So we love having tons of kids at this camp. It's part of what makes it amazing. But if your child is small, you know, 10 or under, so to speak, we really need you to keep an eye on them. And one of the main reasons is the lake, okay? There's a huge body of water down by the dining hall, and we don't want kids wandering out on the dock, falling in the lake. We need to be careful with the bonfires around fire, and there's obviously cars and golf carts and buses going back and forth. So please make an extra effort to keep track of your small children. That is not Tommy and Steven's responsibility, right? Amen. All right. Um, as far as driving, we know that the walk from the dining hall to the worship center is about, I measured it with an app, it's .55 miles. So if you want to take that 12-minute walk, get your steps in, knock it out. But if you want to get a ride, then the buses run right after dinner and right basically before services, the buses will be shuttling people for about an hour before service. So you can jump on a shuttle and get there. There's also some people on golf carts that are happy to give you a ride as well. One of them is my son, Antonio. Where's Antonio at? He's probably delivering someone on a golf cart right now. There he is. He, he accepts tips, just so you know. All right. So we have rides for you is what I'm getting at. But we, don't, we can't handle everybody driving their car up here. So we're going to ask that you do not drive your vehicle up to the worship center for services. However, Jim, being Jim, Pastor Jim, he's making an exception that in the cabins or the lodges, so not the motel ones by the dining hall, but the cabins and the lodges, except Kohler, you can drive a vehicle up here and park. But 
Grab a few other people from your cabin or lodge and try to pack your car so we don't have too many. You guys got that? Um, if you are coming to a service using another mode of transportation, like a bicycle, a skateboard, scooter, that's cool. A one wheel. Steve, Steve was on the one wheel. That was cool. Um, that's fine. But teenagers and children and adults that run after foul balls like me, we can't have bikes, scooters, and those items inside buildings, okay? I have to say that. So keep them outside. Let's see. We're going to do giveaways. Uh, we're going to draw two giveaways tomorrow. I think they're going to put that up on the screen. And you guys want to be a part of this. Uh, to be part of this, you can purchase a raffle ticket. The raffle tickets are 10 bucks, but you can get six for 50 but wait, there's more. You can get 15 tickets for 100 bucks. So if you win, you will win either two tickets to Sukkot 2024 or a shofar from Israel. Is that right? A real authentic $350 value shofar. Uh, Jim decided, being Pastor Jim, he decided to make this event free. Obviously, you pay for your uh, lodging and your food, but the registration for the actual camp, there was no charge. And so because of that, we got to raise some money, all right? So please consider the raffle tickets. It's kind of a fun way to participate. There's more information in your trifold that you guys are definitely going to be reading. Um, so this fall, we are going to do the second Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, at this camp. And thank you. He's excited. Last year, we had 500 people, roughly. And this year, we are going to open it up to 1,000 people. So look around the room. It's going to be double this, okay? So we, we do expect it to sell out. We had such great feedback after last year. I was one of those positive feedbacks. I definitely will be here. The registration is going to open May 1st. And it might get filled in four hours, 24 hours, two days, but... We do think and expect that it will fill up. So if you guys enjoy this weekend, I know you will, Sukkot is this times 10. It's amazing. Seven or eight days, fellowship, connection with God, intimate worship, powerful messages, powerful speakers. It's, it's really something you want to consider doing. So remember that. And tomorrow morning at 9.30, we have e I'm going to get it right. I'm going to slow down. Eli Shokran. He is an Israeli archaeologist. So he goes into those biblical areas and finds discoveries that confirm biblical truths. And fascinating guy. You're going to want to see that. It's 930 tomorrow morning. Um, after tonight's service, uh, all the fathers that stood up, you didn't know this, but you volunteered to help. So thank you. Um, but in seriousness, we do need help pushing these chairs. We need to part the sea, if you will, to clear this out. And if you are a man or an ambitious, ambitious woman, we need your help. So please consider staying after at the end to push all these chairs out. If we all participate, then it will go so quick. And then you can head to the bonfire at 9. We're going to have... Several bonfires, they're going to be lit for you. You're going to leave service. They're already going to be lit. Find a bonfire. I encourage you guys to do that. There's so much great conversation. People play guitar. Really great conversations about the service and life. And so find a bonfire after service tonight. We'll also have another one tomorrow night. So I believe that is it. So where is, before we bring them back up, uh, Pastor Jim has, and, and Cheryl and Carrie. Is Carrie Brown in here? Carrie Brown in here? Where's she at? How many of you know Carrie or interacted with Carrie? Yeah, I know. I know. She's amazing. She doesn't miss a beat. So I know Carrie, Pastor Jim, and Cheryl, and a lot of other people have put a lot of time into this. So, Pastor Jim, why don't you come up? Let's give Pastor Jim a big hand. We'll just keep clapping until he shows up. There he is. Give it up for Pastor Jim Staley.
All right, worship team, we forgot to tell them to come up, but if you guys want to come up, we're going to get started, and you know, anybody else in the mood to worship? How about we skip the word worship and call it a warship, okay? Because that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to, we're going to transform this, or this entire building into a ship of warriors. We are on a sea that is very shaky right now in the earth. How many know that? Okay, we've got end times crazy stuff beginning. We don't know what end times means, but Yeshua said before he took off that, that, that I'm coming soon, okay? And, uh, and I believe that soon is probably sooner than later. And because of the earth realm and the frequencies that are coming out, how many know that the enemy's getting bolder? The enemy's getting very bold. He's not even afraid anymore of, he doesn't hide anything. Entertainment's not hiding anything. Music industry's not hiding anything. You literally have a music artists that are doing witchcraft from the stage and doing chants for Satan, and they're not even hiding it in plain sight. And so if, if the enemy's getting bolder, what do we need to do? We need to go from being kitty cats, ladies and gentlemen, to lions. Because the church has been asleep for 1,700 plus years. We've been hijacked by the Roman church, and most of us don't even know it. But there is a movement in the earth realm right now where God is beginning to say, if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their Land. Let me teach you something real quick while they're putting things together. We've all learned in Christianity growing up in church and American culture and language, when I say the word wicked, you think of evil. But that is not the biblical definition at all. The word wicked and evil are two completely different words with two completely different meanings. Evil is pure evil. Think Satan. Wicked comes from the term wicked. It's where you take two items, like two strings of a candle, they would wick a candle. Wicking a candle would be taking those two cotton strings, twisting them together. If I tell you two things twisted together in the Garden of Eden, what do you think of? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's wicked. You catch me. So what happens when you get to the book of Revelation is God begins to tell his people, stop compromising. Because compromising is means that you're wicked. You're operating in a wicked fashion, not evil. And for a very long time, the enemy has understood this biblical principle. And so he's not about getting God's people to do evil things. He's okay with that. But what he really wants, his agenda, is to get you to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because once you do that, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have a little bit of that sweetness, a little bit of that horseradish, a little bit of that heriset. You'll find out what that means tomorrow. And you'll be okay with a little sourness in your mouth. And that compromise is killing the church. God says this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, is I wish that you were hot or cold, righteous or evil, but because you are wicked, because you are Lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You see, God's power operates through the righteous. You can't claim the scripture that God ordains your footsteps unless you are righteous. And according to, by the way, Thayer's Dictionary, a Christian dictionary of high-level scholastic academic theologians and scholars that know the Hebrew language and the Greek language, that word for righteous literally means keeping the divine laws. That's what it means. That's how God defines righteousness. You guys can play in the background as we get going here. But that's how we define righteousness is by doing what God says. How many of you have children out there? Right? I've got six of those. And when they do right things, they get my favor. Every day I tell each one of them, you're my favorite. If you do the right thing tomorrow, you'll be my favorite. And then you're my favorite. Favor comes to those who follow God. Amen. Well, this weekend, I almost said week because it's about, it feels like Sukkot already out there, the weather and everything. 
This weekend, we want you here locally and we want you online to experience the power of God. We were over there praying and I finished and I said, guys, I just feel like we're supposed to put our hands in here like this is a football game. And the Lord's giving me the word explosion. Everybody say explosion. What we need in the earth realm while, while Gaza and Hamas and Hezbollah and all the crazy Iranian stuff are sending missiles, God's people need to stand up and enter the spiritual war and stop watching Fox News for what's happening over there because it's happening right here. What you see in the spiritual will manifest in the physical, and what you see in the physical will manifest in the spiritual. Everything happens in the heavenly realm first. You want to experience the power of God? It will start with you moving your own mountain of your flesh out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit move. So stand with me this evening. Everybody say, great expectations. Say it again, great expectations. One more time, say, I have great expectation. Do you believe it? Give him a round of applause. The Holy Spirit wants to touch your life. And before we begin, I feel led to say this. I want to recognize the difficulty that some of you guys are in. I want to recognize the spiritual journey of where you're at. Some of you are in an incredible skeptic moment right now. Someone grabbed you on the side of the highway and forced you to come. Maybe some, maybe your husband or your wife said, look, this is your last day on planet Earth if you don't come. Whatever it is, some of you are going through some really difficult things. I'm here to tell you, I've lived a life of difficulty. I've been in the bottom of a dungeon. I know what it's like to be hit by someone in the lunch line just because you look like somebody, their, their pastor that molested them when they were a child. I know what it's like to be in a headlock on the bottom of a prison floor, someone choking you out just because you told them, good move in a chess game. I know what it's like to be slandered, to be gossiped, to have your family stripped from you, to, to be a, a feeling of abandonment and your closest friends leave you just because they don't want to be associated with your name. And I'm here to tell you that the God that allowed me to go into a prison cell is the same God that brought me out early and gave me favor with the very judge that sentenced me to jail. I'm here to tell you that the same God that is there on the mountaintops that gives you that feeling of the glow that Moses had is the same God that was in the bottom of the well with Joseph. And until you believe that, ladies and gentlemen, you will never, ever have your breakthrough. Because your breakthrough, and by the way, for those of you that are waiting for your breakthrough, how many are waiting for breakthrough? Raise your hand. I just want to know where we're at right now. Raise them high. If you want a breakthrough, you got to raise your hand. This ain't like, like God touches the first one that's highest, okay? Look, here's the secret to breakthrough. I learned this sitting in my bunk one night when Jim Staley could not get over the fact that Jim Staley was in prison when I was serving God's people at my height I couldn't give anymore being falsely accused of that and this and everything amplified beyond imagination and God spoke to me and said this Jim Staley this ain't about you you're praying for breakthrough. You're praying for me to let you go in prison. And prison is the only thing that's going to get you to where you need to be because my kingdom is not dependent and is not forwarding your comfort zone. I'm not here to pander to your pride, your ego, or to make your reputation look good. I'm here to crush your pride. I'm here to crush your ego. And I'm here to break the clay and remold it into something that is a vessel used for you and God showed me a, he showed me a ball of clay and it was a beautiful ball of clay and then he showed me his hands digging in to this clay this wet clay which was my life and it hurt and quite frankly it hurt like the, like the, like the fires of hell when God puts his fingers in you ladies and gentlemen it hurts I didn't know what he was doing he's taking things away from me he's taking a whole lot like seven eighths of what that ball of clay was was gone and then the father began to move the wheel and pretty soon 
I began to see what he was doing. He said, Jim, I can't pour into a ball. I'm making a bowl. I'm making a vessel that I can pour into so that would be able to hold my glory and pour it out. Because what I'm pouring on you right now is just coming right off. It's not your fault. The culture made it that way. But I'm digging my fingers in, and it's going to hurt. And I want you to teach my people, do not be afraid of my hand, says the Lord. But it will not come in the way that you think. So your breakthrough comes from this. It's from your desire for breakthrough to grow his kingdom. It ain't about you. It's about your kids. It's about your spouse. It's about the neighbor down the street. It's about the kid on drugs. It's about the person in the corner that's walking down the street the wrong way when worship is coming this way. And you stop on the golf cart and you say, young man, come with me. You're walking away from the presence of God. God is up there on that hill. Your breakthrough is so that God can use you at your full potential. Everybody say full potential. Hallelujah. Full potential is what God wants for you, not breakthrough. Whatever you're going through, it's, it's a purposed, intentional design and footprint in the sand for you to get where you're supposed to be because he's not about your comfort, ladies and gentlemen. He's about his kingdom coming to earth. Let's worship our King. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you, God, that we get this opportunity to come before your throne, not to say, God, we need, but Father, to say thank you, God, for what you did for us. You bled and you raised and the pattern of life in your kingdom is just those two things. Bleed and resurrection. And the faster, Father, that we teach, that we, we learn that, the faster we hit our full potential in you. So Abba, can I ask you, God, in all seriousness, Lord, I'm not praying because of anything other than one thing. Your courtroom is open, and I'm beseeching you with emotion for the rest of this weekend that you would compress 2,000 years of history, of Passovers, that have been missed by your people because we've been pulled away and our eyes have been just gently moving in another direction while the enemy knows to distract us from the real power doing Bible things in Bible ways. So Father, would you let your spirit fall? Let your anointing encompass this place right now. Everybody, hands up, please. And God, I pray in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name, every heart that needs touched, touch the ones where their elbows are the straightest. God, I pray that your spirit would illuminate, that visions and dreams would be common. Healings, Lord, would be automatic in your presence. Deliverance and demons would have no place. Lock the doors of this place in the spirit and let your holy highest angels stir the hearts of your people encompass and circle let the power of your spirit be like at the pool of bethesda at the pool of siloam i should say where the blind man could see open our eyes before you and everybody said
recognize that it is only the enemy that wants to bring a spirit of fear into our life. So Father, we call it out tonight. We say you are not welcome in this place. Spirit of fear, you need to go. You need to leave. You are not welcome here. Do not come back. Father, I ask right now that every person would search inside their hearts and because it's fear, God. It is fear that keeps us from your very heart. It is fear that keeps us from the faith that we are supposed to have inside of you, God, as our one and only that we trust with our lives, even, even to death, God. So, Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that those chains would be broken and there would no longer be fear in this place, that we would not be a slave to fear and that your presence would be here. And let's, I just want to sing that again. And I want anybody in this place who has raised your hand a minute ago, I want you to sing this song at the top of your lungs and proclaim that you no longer are a slave to fear. Can we do that?
under the age of 18 to come up to the front. I want every child of God to be up here. And we're not done with that song. God's putting some highlight on that song. Parents, give them encouragement. Get them up here. I know we got a hundred and something, man. I think like 170 young people in this camp this weekend. Somebody say amen to that. See, it ain't about us. It's about you guys. You're the Joshua Caleb generation that generations have been talking about. There will come a time in the last days when that Joshua Caleb generation will mean something. When we say Joshua Caleb generation, you know what that means? We're not afraid of giants. We're not afraid of giants. So every parent, I want you to reach out your hand. And we're going to pray for these giant killers. Some of you look like way more than 18 years old here. We got some 45-year-old, 18-year-olds. Praise God. They just heard child of God. They start running to the front. Father, we just come before you and we declare that this generation is why we're here. Let them stand on our shoulders, Lord. Let there be no fear, no doubt. Let everything that has held us back in our generation, addiction, sin, compromise, live in one way, and live in another way which creates no way and father we pray that God this would be the generation that would not even have a definition of turn back when they see Jericho Lord they already thank you that it's fallen when they come to the Jebusite city father they say no 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 this is our city thank you for keeping an eye on it but you can leave now Father, we thank you, God, that the glisten in their eye would be the glow from your throne. We thank you, Father God, that you turn their staves into swords. <laughs> and we praise you, Father God, that whether they know the word or not, that the shield that they will hold will be a faith. A faith so strong, so great, so wise, so courageous. that they barely hold it up because they're on the offense all the time. We thank you, Father God, that the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit will match the power of the truth and there will be found the true worshipers. In one generation, the world will change and a revival will come so thick it will, it will literally capsize every revival that's happened before. No one will even discuss or remember the revivals of the past because this revival will be different it will have roots that will go deep it will touch a water that has never been touched a underground river of your power and your love your grace your compassion your mercy and your obedience that you tell us to follow god let this generation be leaders not followers only followers of you and now let's sing that song. And I want just the kids. When I raise my hands up at a certain point in the song, I want all the adults to be silent. And I want my creator to hear the voices of his children. Amen. Amen. Let's do it. Paul.
Let him hear your voices, kids. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. We just thank you, O oh God, that we are your children and you give good gifts. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of take a short, short break, but not really. We're going to stay in an in a, in a attitude and in a humble place of worship, but we're going to take communion with one another. This is air of Shabbat. That simply means this is the evening of Shabbat. And we're going to open up like our ancient ancestors did and welcome the Holy Spirit on what God said to do in Genesis. Uh, in the very first couple chapters, what did he say? He said, on the seventh day, we're going to rest. And I want to rest, and I want to be an example for you to rest. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to enter into God's rest in a symbolic way. And so as you head towards your seats, kids, I want you to, on both sides of the tables, okay, you can take one of these cups on your way back. And as you're doing that, uh, what we want to do is the, as, as they clear out, then the rest of the assembly can begin to grab them as well. And what we want to do so that it goes smooth is if you're in the middle, you're going to go to the back and the lines will be on the far side coming up, okay? Coming up from the far side and back to your seats in the middle after the cattle clear. Praise God, okay? And then we're going to, uh, we're going to thank the Father for sending His Son. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Father. All right, parents, if you want to head to the back and then start that line coming in, that would be great. And we'll do that. We want to do this as quickly as possible, okay? The line should come from the back and up towards the front. So go ahead and don't be shy. Let's go. We have to do this quickly. Praise the Lord. Yep, just grab one or however many you need for your family, however you choose to do that. So the line will come up from the sides and you'll come towards me. Do not walk on the sides towards the back one direction only there we go all right hallelujah Let's just stay in a, in a spirit of worship. Begin to prepare your heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Just thank you. Just thank you. For some of you that are new, this part probably won't be so new, but this is not how we do it in our home. So every single Friday night, the Bible says that the, that the Shabbat, uh, which in English is the Sabbath, is Friday night at sundown till Saturday night at sundown is the seventh day. And God said, on that day, there's no work. You're pulling away. You're resting. 
you do what I do. God didn't even need to rest, and he chose to rest because he's a good dad. He's a good example of what we need to do each and every week. And that Friday night, families from around the world that celebrate the Sabbath, they come together, they sit around the table. Nobody's going to movie theaters. No one's spending the night at their friend's house. There's no basketball games. There's nothing going on. The world shuts down in the spiritual life of the Staley household, and we come together. And my daughter, Sierra, who makes the best challah bread on the planet, if you've never had challah bread, if you've had her challah bread, you've had challah bread, okay? It's a three-braided piece of bread, loaf of bread, and the three braids can represent many things. It can be the Father, it can be the Son, it can be the Holy Spirit, it can be a husband and wife and God. But at the end of the day, when you cut it open, it's one loaf. You cannot see the three braids. Only on the outside can you see the three. Because see, once it goes through the oven, it all becomes one. This is why James says to consider it pure joy to face trials of many kinds because when you do, you become more one with those around you and with the Father, amen? And so in our house, we don't use wafers and we don't use shot glasses of grape juice. We use real bread. But today with 600 people, we're, we're, gonna, we're going old school Catholic Baptist style. How many old school Catholic Baptists do we got in here, right? <laughs> no, you're not even, you're like, too shameful or something it's okay I was an altar boy if you can believe that for the Catholic Church all right so uh, what we're going to do is in, in our home the first thing we do is we typically light candles and those candles represent in our home God the flame of the of the lighter represents Yahweh himself that sends the light to the first candle which is Yeshua who came in the darkness and it's a perfect candle with a perfect flame. And then the other candle is, is dark. It hasn't been lit yet. And this light of the lighter doesn't light this candle. This light, this candle must be lit from the light of Christ. And see, Christ doesn't come over and push his candle on anybody. And so we take that candle and we hold it over the, the flame and we sit there. As I explain to my kids that what most people do is they put their, their wick through the candle wick through the fire of God and they say oh that didn't work because it didn't light me on fire we said God even through fire you can take your hand move it right through there it won't burn it you could take a wick the very thing that's designed to be lit and push it through the flame it won't burn it but when you take that wick and you hover it over that flame and you say God I'm trusting you even though I can't understand I'm not even touching your flame. I don't even under, I don't even, I, I don't even deserve to be in your presence. But I'm gonna sit here because by faith I believe that you can light my life on fire, that I can be what, what you are. And you sit there, what will happen is it'll begin to smolder. And it'll begin to smoke. And the wax begins to burn, that flesh, your own mind, will, and emotions. And then immediately, it's somehow, it's somehow magically, it's, it's spiritual, it's incredible. But the flame jumps. It just jumps. And the moment that it jumps and you put it down, you can't tell which candle's which. Because this is what we're supposed to be, is in the image of God. Now you're gonna meet Eli Shukran here tomorrow. He speaks Hebrew, probably the only one in this room that speaks fluently, and he will tell you that in the shadow of God, that the same root word is image of God. So to be in his shadow is to be in his image. And that's what we're after. And so if I could have security, uh, somebody to grab some for the worship team as well, please. Let's take a moment. And we recognize, so after we, we light the candles, we take the bread and we recognize the body of Messiah, the bread of life. Not that he just died, but to recognize, not in the, in the ancient Catholic version of communion, or, and I'm not picking on Catholics or anything else like that, but I'm saying when you go back to the original, 
Do you recognize the depth of communion and why it meant something? They didn't call it communion. But they're, rep- by the way, do you know where communion came from? Passover. It's where it came from. They never did this until Yeshua stood and said, do this in remembrance of me. And then every Passover, they would do Passover in remembrance of him. And then every time they got together, they did like a miniature one. Because at every meal, every era of Shabbat, they were all getting together. Church wasn't on Sunday morning. Sunday started Saturday night. It's when the disciples met Saturday night after synagogue in their own homes. Doing this, what we're doing right now. I need one too, if you have one next door. Oh, okay. I got it, I got it, I got it, thanks. I want you to appreciate what I'm about to say because the ancient Israelites and the disciples did. When they did this, and they said, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. That meant something to them because when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, where did their bread come from? It came from heaven, the manna. But when they crossed over the Jordan River, if you know your Bibles, it happened during this time. And for the first time, the manna stopped. And the bread came from the earth. And this was the ancient blessing. And although almost all of us have been taught that the bread from heaven is greater, I'm here to tell you that wasn't the original plan or it would have never stopped. The bread from heaven is the supernatural power, divine assistance that you get when you need it the most. When I was in prison, God gave me over 300 prophetic visions and dreams between me and a half a dozen people close to me. When I came out of prison, I didn't have hardly any. My daughter had 72. Many of them open visions, doing laundry. Narnia closet opens up, angel shows up, no, no kidding. Why do those things happen? Bread from heaven. When you're weak. But when you're strong, God said, here's the plan. It's bread from the earth. So don't be seeking after signs and wonders. It's for the weak. Because if Jesus is standing right next to you, I don't need a vision. I don't need a dream. I can feel the presence of God. Amen. So let's take the, 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 the bread. Some of you former Baptists already got it out, but the rest of us are still working on it. Okay. Anybody else having trouble? How do you? Where's the instruction manual? Oh, there it is. I'm about to pull out my phone and do a YouTube video on how to open this thing. All right. The smallest amount of bread means nothing. Because I want you to recognize this. When we pass around the loaf of bread, here's what we do in our house. Everybody's taking a piece. But we all recognize that it came from one loaf. We're all part of the body of of Messiah. Every one of us. When we eat it, we are recognizing that not only we're all part of one body, but I'm eating part of of the the same loaf that you're eating, which makes us connected. We're one. I can't take it back. In ancient covenants, they would split an animal in two. I eat one side, you eat my half, and we can't take it back. Once we consume it, we're in covenant for life. This is the marriage covenant idea. I'll talk more about the threshold covenant and Passover and the prophetic power of it here in a minute after worship. But for now, recognize that this bread represents Yeshua himself. 
and we're going to hold this up. And I for, we, we totally forgot and dropped the ball to put the Hebrew and the English on the screen. So let's write that down for next time. We forgot. But let's ask the Holy Spirit to come and let's thank him first for the bread. Father God, thank you so much for your son, Yeshua. We thank you for Jesus, God. We thank you, God, that he, he came, that he died, but he didn't stay dead. That he came to rise. Death was just a process of glorification. Something all of us need to understand and recognize, Lord. As the enemy tries to twist your prophetic plan for resurrection into just blessing and skipping the death part. All of us need to die to our mind, will, and emotions, God, and we're willing to do that tonight as we eat this and recognize and represent your, your, your body of your son. Let it also represent your word that we consume it and be in covenant with you. And if you are not a believer here tonight, don't do this. You can't do this. The Bible is very, very clear. It is a serious sin to, to act like you're in covenant because this represents the blood of the Lamb. So, Father, as we eat, we ask that you would bless it. If you know the Hebrew blessing, with me, say it with me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malek Halam Chamotzi Lachem Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. You may eat. At the same time, the grape juice represents. Obviously grapes, but the most powerful part of the grape juice is recognizing that it was once on the vine. It was beautiful. It was plump, but it was never meant to stay there. And some of you are in your spiritual journey right now, and God just plucked you off the vine, and you don't understand what's going on. I'm here to tell you it's part of the process. James got it. That's why he said, consider pure joy. You're on your way to being in the hand in the chalice of the king. Grapes have to be not only plucked, unfortunately, they have to be crushed. I've been there. I know what it feels like. The crushing part is not okay. It's not fun. There's no part of it where you're like, oh, God, I just consider this pure joy to be crushed. But I learned, no, I don't have to consider the moment pure joy. I have to, by faith, look past it and go, oh, I know the whole things work together for good. So by faith, I'm in the future saying, thank you, God, for what I'm going through right now because I know you're about to turn the, the head over on the enemy and kill that snake. So let us thank the Lord, not only for the blood of the Messiah, but the cup in Judaism and ancient, our ancient ancestors of the Israelites said this. They recognize that the cup represents celebration. Wine is celebration. So this is a wedding. And just like... This, the, the first miracle that Jesus ever did was at the wedding of Cana. Let this be the first miracle in your life. And let us start right now. If you know the Hebrew blessing, sing it with me. Say it with Actually, sing it with me. That's kind of dangerous. No, let's just say it on account of embarrassing my children. <laughs> Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Malech Alam. Berei Peri Hagafen. Blessed, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. L'chaim. Everybody say L'chaim. That means to life. So now that you know what it says, let's say it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. L'chaim. To life. Stand with me and let's move into worship again and give glory to our King. I hope you guys didn't travel near and far to go to bed at 7.30. Okay? Parents, we need to outlast our kids tonight. Let's worship. Amen.
the doors swing wide. See, glory as I run inside the throne room before you. I bow, I bow. The veil is torn, the doors swing wide. I see, glory.
Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever.
presence. We thank you for the freedom to worship you and your son. God, I pray right now, Father, for every burden represented here, God, that this weekend, Father, that these people would leave the burden at your feet, that they would call upon your name for the first time and surrender. God, I pray for hearts that are still not softened, minds that are closed, Father, that they would surrender in the flesh and open their spirit tonight. God, your presence is here, and I thank you for that, Jesus. I want to share a quick story about a month ago. I was at the beach with my family, and it was very windy, so the waves were bigger than normal. And my boys are not easily intimidated by big waves. But my 11-year-old, it was too much for him. He thought he could handle it, of course. He's competitive, he's athletic, he thinks he can handle a lot. And these waves got bigger and bigger, and he was yelling something. And I was on the beach looking at him, but it didn't click because I couldn't hear him. But as soon as I heard Daddy, I knew he needed me. And as soon as I looked at his face and heard, Daddy, I need your help, I ran so fast. And I didn't trip over any concrete stuff that time, but I ran into the waves. I had stuff in my pockets. I didn't care. I dove into those waves and grabbed my son, and I brought him to the shore. And... I think the lie that the enemy has spoken over you guys, some of you, is that you are supposed to do this alone. That you are burdened, you are tired, you feel defeated, hopeless, lost, and that pain that you're feeling is, it's yours. But you have a father And if you call upon his name this weekend, the shift that's available for you, it will happen. Just call upon his name. He will come running. That's my word for you guys. Let's close this out in prayer. And then Pastor Jim's going to come up. Father, you said in your word, in Matthew, You said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God, I pray that every person at the sound of my voice would surrender this weekend to you. They would call upon their father. They would call upon their father. They would not suffer in silence. They would not suffer alone, but that they would find intimacy with you that they've never experienced before. That peace that passes understanding would become real in their lives. That they would empty themselves of the flesh so that you can fill them with your spirit. In Yeshua's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat kids. That was amazing to watch you guys worship.
Let's give God praise real quick. Thank you, worship team. Amen. How many enjoyed worship? Hallelujah. Is it too late for me to preach? All right, everybody in the front row said no. Everybody else is a little sketchy back there. All right. Praise God. Okay, we're going to begin. <clears throat> the title of tonight's message, and, I, and they told me I'm on a very tight uh, schedule. I have to be done by 1 a.m. because that's curfew. So I need to get started because there's a lot to talk about. Tonight's message is called, for those of you who don't know me, I was a total joke. It's completely joking, right? Uh, I'm going to try to make this as short as possible. And for those of you that know me, you also know that that's a joke. Okay. So tonight's message is entitled, The Prophetic Power of Passover. And the reason why I entitled it that is because I believe that one of the most powerful prophetic events that ever happened in the history of mankind happened 3,400 and almost 44 years ago on the 10th plague. And so we're going to start there at the institution of the Passover because this is a Passover moment. This is a Passover weekend. And so we need to understand what is being passed over because I'm going to suggest to you that by the end of this message, some of you are going to be shocked, enlightened, and blown away at the power of of the Passover and what really was happening on that faithful night for the Egyptians and on that victorious, exhilarating resurrection, open the prison doors moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And that's what we're going to talk about. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 12 real quick. And that's where we're going to find the beginning of tonight's message. And I will do the same. This is the this is the moment, ladies and gentlemen, after 400 plus years being in captivity underneath the heavy hand of the Egyptians. As a matter of fact, we know we talk about that a lot, but we don't remember that God was the one that brought them there. God was the one that brought Joseph there first to prepare the way, and then Jacob and the, and the rest of the 70 people that came in and they were there and they were treated as kings. They got the best land in all of Egypt. But then there was a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. How many of you start your life and things go great and things are amazing and all of a sudden there is a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph comes into your life and life begins to change and the very place that you were at that you thought you were blessed is now a curse. Let me suggest to you something that's in between the text that's in our scripture, what we call scripture, that, that's not there, but it's there, is that God's plan was both. You see, we don't like that because we want God's blessing, but we define blessing in a way that God doesn't define blessing. Blessing is not just material things. It's not just happiness. How many know blessings can come in packages that are very scary? Ask Joseph at the bottom of the well if that was a blessing or a curse. Ask him three years later and he'd say, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Thank you, my brothers. That's why he said when his brothers came and visited him, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 48 or 49, they're scared out of their mind. He takes off his headdress. They're about to completely pass out. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. It wasn't you that threw me in the well. This was all by the hand of God. Because Joseph realized it wasn't about him. In the beginning, Joseph is wearing the coat of many colors. Joseph knew exactly what he was doing when he went out to the shepherd's field with his brothers. And they're all working hard and shucking stalls and dealing with smelly sheep. And Joseph comes out there in a coat of many colors because it was all about him. I'm the favored child. And God said, oh, man, Joe, I, this is going to hurt, man. But you got some ego that you got to let go. 
And so there he goes in the bottom of a well. So let's read with me. In verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. By the way, this is what happened on the solar eclipse of 2024 on Nisan 1 was the solar eclipse. Now, that might not mean a lot to some of you that are brand new, but in God's calendar, see, there's two calendars. You got man's calendar, and then we have what? God's calendar. How many of you are married out there? Raise your hand. Whose calendar matters, yours or your wife's? You can write whatever you want down on your calendar. It means nothing without your wife's signature. I can tell my wife this is what I'm doing. She's like, really? Okay. Good try. Let's see how well that works out for you. Right? God has a calendar. He set it in the moon and the stars. Genesis chapter 1 4, and verse 14 says, I put the sun, moon, and the stars in the sky for signs and for seasons. And the word signs there is not directional signs. Literally, the word in the Hebrew means omen or warning. It's what it means. It's the Hebrew word for warning. It can also be the Hebrew word for miracle. And the word there for seasons has nothing to do with spring, summer, winter, or fall. But is the word moedim that most of you know. It literally means the appointed times. It's the feast days of the Lord. It's God's calendar. God says, I put the sun, moon, and the stars in the sky so you would know what time to meet with me. So if this is the time and the season that God said, I want you to meet with me, and these are the seven Moedim, these are the seven times that I want you to meet with me, I'm waiting for you, my beloved. I didn't choose the seventh day and stop and, and rest so that you could choose the fourth or the third or the first. I chose it so that you would know this is the time and the season that I have chosen, says the Lord. So if you are Satan, so let's all put our Satan hat on right now. I'll get emails on that. I know it. And pretend that you're the enemy and this is a strategic war against your former employer and you know that God created a calendar and he put the Sun moon and the stars in the sky so he so his people would know when to meet with him what would be one of your highest level strategic warfare tactics that you would want to do when you're meeting with your minions and you say look man God just the creator guy you know the guy the bad guy that kicked us out because we wanted a piece of the action he created this calendar. He, he just gave it to Adam and Eve. They have no idea what's going on. We need to do something about this because if they're in sync with the Creator and they meet with Him on the days that He's waiting for them, then we've got a problem on our hands. So what does He do? He creates a different calendar. And He uses God's people to do it. Wicked. Remember what I taught you? It's wicked. It's good and it's evil. It has the semblance of good. How many know James chapter 5? I believe it is. He says, you have a form of godliness, but you deny what? It's power. Now, let me just throw this out to you. Do you think that the people that James is talking to have any idea the power they're denying? No. Because they have a form of godliness, and the godliness brings a little bit of a little bit of chill it brings a little bit of feeling it brings a, a, a sense of anointing but it's not all of the anointing Paul says I didn't come with you with persuasive words I came to you with demonstration of power so I asked the Christian church a worldwide today where is the power The greatest witness that you could be, ladies and gentlemen, is not going door to door. It's when they're standing at your door because they've heard of the power of God showing up in your family's life. The greatest witness that you can be is a light. It's a city on the hill. Yeshua said, be a light. Be a city on the hill. Why, why did he say that? Because that's a Hebrew idiom. In the first century, the light of the world was literally the temple. It was a Jewish idiom. Everyone knew it. The light of the world. They said this. So when Jesus is talking, he says, you are the light of the world. He's pointing to the temple right there on, on top of the mount. And he says, you have heard it say it's the light of the world. See, all this is understood that you don't know unless you know. 
that he's saying that the temple was the light, the menorah on the inside representing the seven spirits of God, the seven Moedim, the seven days of creation, that's all one, 66 pieces, 39 on the left, 27 on the right, know your Bible, that's 39 in the old, 27 in the new, making up one word of God, one light of God. He says, all of that's incredible, but I'm about to transform what you think is the light to you. You are the city on the hill you are the walking Mishkan. You're the walking power of God. And Satan knew it. So he hijacked the calendar. Had Roman pontiffs come in and just mix a little bit. We got the resurrection of Jesus, but we're going to call it after the goddess Ishtar. Because that's when they worshipped her. It was the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. If you didn't know, that's why Easter is on Easter Sunday. Just a small compromise. He's okay with this eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And none of that was even part of my message. Precious, you've been in my congregation for a very long time. I used to have a shirt that they made for me that said, what verse am I on? Remember that? Because I would just start preaching and forget where in the world did I go. I'm not sure we read even verse 1, but let's start again. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, yes, we did. This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first of months of the year for you. Nisan 1, April 8th of this year, solar eclipse. The power of Nisan 1 is so significant we don't even know. Did you know that's the day that Noah opened the hatch? First time, see, dry land. It's the day Nehemiah left to go rebuild the temple. It's the day that Hezekiah re-cleaned the temple. All of Nisan 1, by the way, if I didn't say it, it's God's new year. It's the beginning of the year for God. Incredibly, 14 days later, when the moon is at its full, on the first month of God's calendar, the son of the living God was hanging on a tree for us. Cleansing the temple of every man, woman, and child that would claim the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of their hearts. We need to get on God's calendar because it says this in verse 3, Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household. This is unbelievable if you know the biblical timeline of the passion of the Christ. Because on the tenth day of Nisan in the New Testament... What happens? Jesus is riding. Yeshua is coming on a donkey into, the, into Jerusalem. The palm branches are going as the high priest and all million people that are in Jerusalem at that time are hailing and hailing and excited and celebrating as the high priest is showing off the lamb that they chose that's going to be sacrificed four days later right according to the law of God. And Yeshua is riding on a donkey, and everybody, and most of us grew up in Christianity thinking the whole, all of Jerusalem is celebrating him. They're not. They're celebrating the high priest bringing in the lamb that's about to be sacrificed. But all of the followers of Christ are celebrating Yeshua and how he is going to be king. And they have no idea he's going to be sacrificed four days later. They have no idea that Jesus is literally fulfilling prophecy as being the lamb that's chosen on the 10th of Nisan. Somebody say amen. amen. Every single thing in your Bible has a reason. We just need to read the front of the book. Verse 4, if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Yeshua was without blemish. A male of well, the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That's Monday night, by the way. That's when Passover technically is. Somebody ought to go tell the bus driver I just got started. He can come in and relax. Keep it till the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Between the evenings is what that Hebrew phrase is. And just give me, give me an idea what between the evenings is. Afternoon, 12 o'clock high, is the beginning of the evening in, in ancient uh, Israel culture. 
6 p.m. is the end. That's the evening. So between the evenings is what? 3 p.m. Guess when Yeshua dies on the cross? 3 p.m. Because that's when the Torah says it's supposed to be killed. Let's scoop down to verse 7. It said, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house where they shall eat it. This is going to be key. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs, its entrails, everything. You shall let none of it remain until morning. What remains of it until morning? You shall burn with fire. Okay? And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, the staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It's the Jewish Passover. Wait a minute. Did I read that right? Oh, no, no. It says the Lord's Passover. My bad. One of the tricks of the enemy over the last 1,700 years, and I keep saying that because that's about the time when Rome, the Christian uh, Gentile church was really flourishing and everything got mixed up and messed up because they didn't know their Hebraic heritage. By then, the Jews had fled to Pella, the Christians to Yavne at 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, and everybody was trying to figure it out. So because the Jews people over the last 1,700 years are the only people that are really keeping the Passover, it's today's Western Greco-Roman mindset where we call it the Jewish Passover because they're the ones keeping it. I can assure you that if it was the Christians that were one keeping it, everyone would say, oh, you don't want to keep the Christian Passover. It's not the Jewish Passover. According to Scripture, it's God's. It's the Lord's Passover, yod He vav He, in the four-letter tetragram, it's on Yahweh. It is His. It's His feast. No one owns His calendar, ladies and gentlemen. We're invited to the party. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. Listen carefully. I will strike at the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. Don't you love that? He knows where all this is coming from. All the gods of Egypt, the fallen angels that have taken their place to try to take some of his glory. He is about to come down hard. This is not just against the Egyptians. He's going all the way to the root of their tree. Now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Thus the word Pesach, Passover. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You know what's really incredible? The, the, the Hebrew word for plague here is a little different than what you might think. In English, the plague is like a super bad thing. And it can be a bad thing. But in Hebrew, that word uh, negef literally can mean uh, to trip. It can mean a striking or a blow. Some of you in your life, you feel like you've been struck down. I felt that way when God allowed a plague in my life. But see, sometimes plagues are, are okay. They wake you up. How many know that, that, and especially when you were younger or maybe you got teenagers, you're walking in one direction. You have no idea the gap that you're creating between you and God. Until you fall... And you can't believe how much it hurt when you fell. And unbelievably, the fall caused you to turn around and you see the gap. And now that you see the gap, you begin to bridge the gap. And it doesn't dawn on you that the only way that you saw and the only reason why you saw the gap is because of the fall. Because of the plague. Some people say, Pastor Jim, God didn't like the Egyptians. He was trying to, to, to remove the Israelites, his people from the Egyptians because he hated the Egyptians. He doesn't hate anybody. He loves all of his people that he created, but that doesn't mean all the people he created are his. He gave them 10 chances. That's how I know he loved the Egyptians. 10 chances. How many know that God's given you 10 chances in your life? We just don't see them as plagues every time you have a consequence to your sin. 
He wants to bring a Passover blood. I'm telling you, the blood is the only answer to every, every question and every problem that you have. It's the blood. And what you're going to learn in just a moment about the Passover, I believe, is going to change everything on how you look at this feast and how you feast with the Lord. He says, I'm going to pass over you now. However, how many of you have always learned, and you see it even on the Prince of Egypt and the cartoon movies and Ben-Hur and commandments, all that stuff, that, that, that what happens? That when the Passover spirit of death comes, he comes up and he like floats in and sees the blood on the, on the, on the, po on the doorpost and the lintel. And the camera angle is always here, never down. And you're going to know why in just a moment. He shows the blood here, shows the blood here, and then cruises over that little hut. But then he goes in to the Egyptian homes and kills the firstborn. How many know what I'm talking about? You've seen that. Can I suggest to you that is not at all what happened? He did not pass over the house. That is an American Western assumption because we don't read the front of the book. Our theologians don't know the front of the book. Our pastors don't study the front of the book because the enemy had another strategic plan to say the front of the book don't matter. Read the back of the book, Christian. Stay away from the front of the book. It's done away with. It's for the Jewish people. All of that is none of that. God nailed it to the cross. Don't look at it. When the enemy says don't look, you know he's hiding something. The house of God is not built on sand, ladies and gentlemen. And would it shock you to learn that when Jesus, when Yeshua said, I build my house on a rock, that he didn't invent that phrase? That was a famous rabbinical idiomatic expression. To build your house on a rock meant to build it on the pure written word of God. In the first century, they would have called it the Torah and the prophets. Not on the tradition and doctrine of men, but I'm going to build it on the word of God. How many know that's a pretty, gar pretty doggone good illustration? The rock. And that's why Yeshua said, I'm the rock. But Peter, you're the little rock. But I'm going to build my church, and this is, this is where it all gets messed up. Because we're not there in the moment to see the hand gestures and the things that are happening. You can see it in the original language when you look at it. And when you know the front of the book and the back of the book combined, you can see exactly what he was saying when he talked to Peter. Whose name is, 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 is Little Rock. I would imagine when something like this, Peter, as he touches him on his, hand, on, on his chest, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Upon this rock, how do we know that? Because the front of the book says that the Messiah is the rock, the stumbling stone that men trip over. Either you trip over it now or it'll crush you on judgment day. He is the rock, Amen. He's the rock that David prophesied about. So back to this. Let's go to this. I want you to go to, uh, let's see, let's go here and pull up Hebrews chapter 10. This incredible, incredible scripture that we've read a thousand times without understanding the true meaning and how this is related to the Passover. What I say? Hebrews chapter 10. Start with me in verse 26. And it says this. It says, For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth. By the way, what is the definition of sin? 1 John 3, 4. It's the only definition you're going to find. Sin is the transgression of God's law. Period. There's no other definition. Get rid of, get rid of God's law and what do you do? You remove sin. There is no other definition. Again, strategic by the enemy scratch away high begin to play shell games with how you define sin and then you have today in america gender confusion because you know why there's no definitions anymore remove god's definitions and every man will do whatever's right in his own eyes it says this if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries listen carefully anyone who has rejected moses's law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses and then here is the verse 
put it up on the screen, of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, some of you don't see the covenant language here. But what I'm about to share with you is going to illuminate this and put it into the atmosphere. Because what the author of Hebrews is saying, which I believe potentially could be the Apostle Paul, whoever it was, this guy was pure, pure on Jewish. He was Hebrew to the bone. He knew the Old Testament, he, what we call uh, the, the front of the book, what he called the scriptures. And this is what it means. During the Passover, it wasn't just the sides and, and, and the header board, the lintel and the sides. When it says the cup of blood, and every one of us have seen the pictures of them holding the cup of blood from the, from the lamb, and they're, and they're taking the hyssop branch and they're painting. That is not how it happened. That word in Hebrew is not cup. It's basin. There was a threshold that you walk into. Everybody knows it was a threshold, right? You walk over the threshold. And there was, a cut, there was a basin built into the threshold with a small crack that ran across the threshold. And they would take the blood, put it in that basin, and it would run across the crack. Now, the only time that they did that was when they cut covenant. So they would kill the goat or the lamb or whatever they were having. They would put the blood in there. And when you, now, look, this is kind of strange, but we're Americans. We're not in Eastern culture in ancient times so we don't get this but I'm hoping that you'll get what I'm about to say because it's gonna make the whole Passover experience in the blood of Christ mean something so much more that when they killed the blood of the lamb they put it in the basin then took the hyssop dipped it in the basin put it all the way around the blood is all the way around when they invited somebody over for dinner if you stepped over the blood over the threshold you are entering into covenant and agreeing with the death of the animal that you were going to partake in. If you stepped on the blood, if you stepped on the crack, right? You are disagreeing and profaning and is worse than cursing that person to his face. It is one of the greatest insults in ancient history, and by the way, in every culture, most every culture. This was not an Israelite thing. They knew exactly what to do because this was done in many cultures. <coughs> Excuse me, to their gods. They already had the basins there for a reason. But when that blood went across, and you wanted to sup with the person in there, when you crossed that and the blood, you're in covenant with that person. And the moment that you feed on whatever was dead, you become alive with them, one. Wow. Because what's really happening, ladies and gentlemen, at the Exodus on the 10th plague, which was the plague of what? Death of the what? What's the first plague? Blood into what? And that's an interesting. First plague, blood, river of blood. Last plague, death of the firstborn. Think there might be a connection so watch this so the blood goes from the lamb into the basin is crossing over like a red sea and when they obey the Lord and they do this the spirit of the living God it's not some random death angel demon that God hired to kill the Egyptians it's the spirit of the living God that is coming through the camp and when he sees that he's going into every single house, he's not passing over the house, he's passing over the threshold. The moment he passes over the threshold and he sees the blood, he recognizes the invitation and he creates covenant with those people. The ones that do not have the blood die because no one can stand in the presence of a holy God. So the firstborn is taken. Why is the firstborn taken? Because according to this covenant language, the ancient threshold covenant, the only way to have covenant is for something to die. 
So Adam in the garden was the firstborn. His sin had never been paid for. According to scripture, the firstborn must die. But because the Egyptians chose not to have covenant with God, they could never leave their house. The firstborn could never leave. So when you fast forward 1,400 years to the time of Christ, it's a reason why God didn't send the secondborn. He sent his only begotten firstborn son who died on the very day that his people were putting the blood of the lamb to have sup and covenant with God. He died as the lamb of God because if he doesn't die, ladies and gentlemen, and that blood doesn't fall to that ground on that threshold, there is no way for you to leave Egypt. You die in your sins. But the moment that the blood is shed and it hits the ground, he had to sit there. I submit to you, he had to be on the cross till the blood hit the ground. You know why? Because Adam's very name is divine blood. Adam's very name, his very character, his humanity was formed from the dirt. It was Adam's sin that had to be paid for. The moment that the blood hit the ground, the ground stopped crying out. This is crazy deep stuff, guys. The science alone behind this, I could spend an hour telling you about why the blood is so powerful, why there is light built into the blood, why in the scientific level, the Bible says there's life in the blood. Science just figured this out. That when the, when the blood, remember when it says that the ground cried out of Cain? The ground is crying out because Adam defiled it. Every one of us are born into sin, not because of anything other than Adam. His, his sin had to be dealt with. So moment that his sin is forgiven, guess what? All of us are in Adam. It's a domino effect all the way down. The only thing that you got to do is take the blood of the lamb and put it on the threshold, and God has covenant with you. If you don't, you're stuck in your sin, and you will die. So the firstborn of God must die so that the threshold covenant could be set and you get the choice of whether you want to step on or step over. Has anybody ever heard of the tradition of carrying the bride over the threshold? This is where it comes from. In African-American culture, they call it the jump the broom. They, it, it's fascinating. I've read many articles on this. Uh, they, they put a broom down on, the, on a wedding day. They, the bride and the groom will jump over the broom. And there's historians that they can't quite figure out. They can trace it all the way back to the 1800s and then all the way back to Africa themselves. But they don't know exactly where the origin is. I'm here to tell you I know because the ancient Israelites found themselves all the way back from the King, Queen Sheba into Africa. And this custom of jumping over or walking over the threshold to create covenant found itself in the greatest covenant that God ever created outside of us with man, and that's a man and a woman. When they go and cross over the covenant, they are literally, symbolically showing the power covenant of the Most High God and His bride. And you know where the broom came from? Because at the threshold is where they put the straw. So when, the, when, you're, when you're inviting a guest over, guess what you got to do? You got to sweep it away. The symbology this is incredible. Sweeping away the sin, sweeping away the feed for the animals and putting true life into that threshold. This is why it says, we'll read it again and it'll make something Makes sense. It'll have sense now. Uh, how much worse punishment do you suppose? In Hebrews chapter 10, we are again. Verse 29. Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. Do you get it now? This is covenant language. You don't trample the Son of God underfoot when it says... He counts the blood of the covenant as a common thing. The blood of the covenant in this Hebrew's mind is right there at the threshold. And it's the blood of Christ, and he steps on it. 
You think that's common? You think that's profane? That is set apart and holy. And the moment you stepped on it, you are discontinued. You are the firstborn Egyptian. Is this making sense? Can I go just a little bit longer? Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 9 says it this way. In the same way, excuse me, in the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. What are they doing? This is an incredible phrase that has hidden meaning. They didn't step on the the threshold, did they? What I teach you, step on the threshold, you're denying the covenant. So what happens when you leap over the threshold? First of all, that's insinuating there's excitement. I'm making an agreement, but what am I doing? It says right here, with violence and deceit. So someone is leaping over the covenant, all excited to have relationship, but it's with deceit. And it's going to bring violence. This is why God says in the New Testament, and we read right past all this stuff, ladies and gentlemen, do not be unequally yoked. You don't step over the threshold with someone that is not your equal. It will bring deceit and violence, and some of you have found out that the hard way. You see the beautiful covenant language. The power of the Passover is so beyond what us as believers have been taught because we've been hunting Easter eggs most of our lives. And I'm not just poking fun. I used to do it myself. I loved it. I was the fastest third grader out there. My mom has a video of me, you know, on the starting line. Everyone is, there's eggs everywhere. And what am I doing? I'm running to the end of the field. Just running past all the, I don't even know why I'm running to the end of the field, like it's some sort of race. But just as a third grader is running through all the eggs, trying to find whatever he doesn't even know what he's looking for, we as believers have been running around the the, the sand in the wilderness, having no idea what we're really looking for. And then all of a sudden, water comes out of a rock, and we're like, oh, this must be the place where God wants us to be. And we have no idea that this is just the wilderness, and God is providing just a little bit. So what do we do as Christians? Because we're so not used to the power of God, we camp out whenever we experience it. Because we have no destination in mind. We don't even know there's a promised land. Did you know that the Israelites traveled? It's only 11 days from Kadesh Barnea to the promised land. 11 days journey. Took them 40 years. Is that not like American Christians? I mean, that's just exactly what we are. It should take us five minutes to get to the power of God, and we got to spend 45 years before we finally get it. I'm here to tell you prophetically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is about to break this earth open. And the line is going to be drawn in the sand and the threshold covenant is going to be invited again. The invitations are going out to go back and do Bible things in Bible ways and shed the skin of your forefathers. It's not meant for you. It's not meant for this generation. God allowed it in Egypt for 400 years. But the last generation in Israel, God says, the Egyptian skin's coming off. That is not my people. That is not what I want this generation to look like. And I'm here to tell you and proclaim and decree by faith that this generation that's alive today is not like yesterday's generation. God is not going to do something new. He's going to do something renewed. And when you see it, you will rejoice because there will be Sukkot and Passovers and Moedim places like this all over the planet. And the mega churches will be empty on those days. Because the days of singing kumbaya, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody standing under one spout for the one single drop are over. God wants to waterfall his glory. He wants to waterfall his anointing. He wants to waterfall healing. And by the way, it ain't about healing. It ain't even about deliverance. Those things are natural, not the supernatural. God showed me this in prison. He said, Jim, why do you call? You want to be in my kingdom presence. You want to live in my realm, but you keep calling what I think is natural, supernatural. Why don't you just say what it is and live in my kingdom and call it normal? It's a a mindset change. So I don't want to live in the supernatural. I want to live in God's natural. 
Everybody say, God's natural is my natural. Amen. Almost done. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2 will be our last verse. And it says this. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Now, if you're a back-of-the-book person like I was for many years of my life, decades of my life, then this verse is also not going to have a full meaning. So let me give you a little bit of context so you can really appreciate what's happening here. Based on the Passover prophecy that God creates covenant through thresholds and it all starts with death and it ends with resurrection and it ends with an exodus. That word cup is not cup. See, the English uh, translations are so frustrating because we're thinking of a cup. But the word is a basin at the threshold. It's the same word that we just read in Exodus chapter 12. Ironically, in Zechariah chapter 12. Hint, hint. So he's saying that Jerusalem is going to be the cup. Is going to be the basin. Is going to be the threshold. Watch this. The threshold of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. What's it saying? When they, lead, when they siege Jerusalem, and by the way, it says uh, Judah, Judah for a reason. If you haven't seen identity crisis, you, 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 you can't understand three quarters of the front of the book. Anybody agree? Identity crisis, anybody ever seen it out there? It puts it all together. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Because there's two houses of Israel. The house of Judah in the south. And there's the house of Israel in the north, the ten tribes. If you don't know that, when it says house of Israel, you're going to think the Jewish people. Because that's what you were taught in Sunday school. That's not at all what it means. There's 12 tribes at the base of Mount Sinai. Only one was Jewish. Well, technically two if you add Simeon and Judah. But Judah is the house in the south. So when it says they lay a hold against Judah... In Jerusalem, we, that tells us we're in the southern kingdom. This has been split. This is a prophecy in the future. And I'm telling you right now, it's today. Because the Jewish people that exist today are not from the northern house of Israel. That's Dan and Naphtali and Gad. All of them that are scattered throughout the four corners of the earth that God planted to be little lights, a.k.a. they would come in through the Messiah. Strangely enough, that happened with the blood of Christ. You can call them Christians today. And we're coming back to what? We're coming back to the roots of our faith because there is one people of God. And God says in his word, he says, I inhabit the praise of my... Nope. It says Israel. Your Bible says people. But that is not the word. And go look it up. It was changed on purpose. Because we can't have God's people today in a Christian church being called Israel. That changes all of our theology. So we might as well throw out Paul in the New Testament when he says that you're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and all the covenants of promise. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been defrauded. And I can't go as far as to say intentionally, but I do know the enemy is behind a lot of things. And the more that I read the Bible, the more I understand it from the original language and culture and expressions, the more the power of God shows up because the pipes are starting to get aligned. It all starts to make sense. And then when I explain it to my kids, they're like, Dad, this makes sense. Then they connect that with the power that they see of miracles and healings and divine uh, utterances of God. And they're never going to walk away from God. My children will never be in the 74 percentile that, that deny Christ at the end of their first semester in college. Because the foundation is secure. Raising them in the way that they should go. Would it shock you that the, that, that terminology, the reason why... The early Christians called themselves the way, the sect of the way, is because the way was, again, an idiomatic expression that meant following God through the Torah without the traditions and doctrines of men, through the spirit of Messiah. That's what it was. The sect of the way was one of the 26 sects of Judaism in the first century that chose to only follow God's instruction manual And any tradition that contradicted it, they got rid of. And they let the Holy Spirit guide them. 
True worshipers worship in what? Spirit and in truth. So today it says this, that Jerusalem is going to be a threshold of drunkenness, meaning that when the enemy besieges them and tries to cross over the threshold, they will stumble and fall and they won't even know what happened to them. Iran has no idea, the lion, that they're waking up. Believe what you will, but my Bible says that lions defeat kitty cats every time. And today, ladies and gentlemen, as I close, I want to challenge you that the prophetic power of the Passover is inside of you. The threshold of God is inside of you. You know how I know? Because he says that you are the Mishkan. You're the temple of God. In Acts chapter 2, what happened? There was fire that came down from heaven. Everyone knows this. It's called Pentecost. But nobody knows it's called Shavuot. Most, Most of us grew up believing that that's when Pentecost started. They've been celebrating Pentecost for 1,400 years before that. To the day, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments came down, and God said, I'm going to bring all my people who are going to be kingdom of priests. And, and they said, no, 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 Moses, you go up, you do that. And then they did the whole golden calf thing, and most people don't realize that what got stripped from them is the priesthood. So 1,400 years later to the day, what happens? God says, I gave you the commandments, the truth on on Mount Sinai. Now I'm giving you one more shot. Here's the threshold. And the Spirit of God came down. And that's why he says you are a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. You were always a kingdom of priests, but you disqualified yourself through your ancestors. This is another shot. And the reason why it was tongues of fire is because over the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle stood what? A pillar of fire. And the pillar of fire was one purpose, to let everybody know the God of Israel is right below. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when the tongue of fire comes over you, God was saying in the first century in Acts chapter 2, this is where my presence resides. So you, worship team, you can come up. You are the threshold in your life. The question is, is the blood in the basin Or is it only on the doorpost only? Because most of us, because we've been taught, oh, well, three out of four is not bad. But then you leave the bottom open and the enemy creeps in. Compromise. Choosing to do things your way. Not following and doing Bible things in Bible ways. And I'm not talking about in legalistic ways. I'm talking about just saying, God, if this is for real, I want to serve you. But most of us are so turned on by our traditions and our memories and our emotions because we've made Christianity and serving God about what we feel. We've made it about us. Most of us have no idea, at least most of you do, but most around the world, worship team, you can come up, please, that the golden calf, they were not worshiping the golden calf from their perspective there's two perspectives in this world there's god's perspective and then there's man's perspective from god's perspective they says mo get out of my way they're an idolatry but from man's perspective go read it aaron says tomorrow is a feast to the lord from their perspective they lost Moses and Moses was the mediator between God and man and they had learned in Egypt that you cannot have a connection with any God without a mediator So they lost Moses they created the mediator and they were going to worship Yahweh through the golden calf and God said we're not doing that here Is this making sense We need to get rid of the golden calf my friends Please stand with me The power of Passover is in you. Will you allow God to do something new and to renew your relationship with him in a new way, in a deeper way? Some of you have been celebrating Passover for 20 years like me. Some of you, this is your very first Passover. You don't even know, come here from Sikkim. This is all new. God's blood is for every single one of you and he's calling out in the nations right now his people from Egypt and the saddest part is most of us have no idea that we're even there 
because we love God. You don't think that there were Israelites 400 years later that didn't remember, that didn't love God? There certainly was the remnant that remembered the God of their ancestors, Jacob. But they had no idea that they were in Egypt and many of them chose not to go with Moses. There are so many people sitting in churches today that love God and have no idea what they're missing. They look at the front of the book, they look at the feast days, they look at these things that, 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 that God is trying to put in front of them and they see a desert when God sees a promised land. You see, one of the hidden <coughs> features of God is He's never going to show you the promised land right off the bat. You know why? Because that makes it too easy to leave. He's going to show you a desert and a small shadow, just enough of a rose, just a little sh stream to make you take a single step. And when you do, the stream gets wider. The roses begin to grow. The flowers and the ferns and the grass begin to come up around the desert river. And then what happens is the desert is turned into the Garden of Eden. And you don't even know how it happened. Joseph was here, our MC, last year for the very first time never celebrated anything like this and the power of God was so overwhelmed in his life it transformed him and everyone around him but many of us have had experience like this in our churches in our past but I'm here to tell you there's more and there will always be more so Father we come before you Every head bowed and eyes closed. And I know it's late and I apologize. But someone needed to hear this message because there's someone here that's fighting this. I can feel it. There's a resistance in the room. You're not sure about any and all this. Holy Spirit says, be sure about me. Stop looking for this and that and look for me. Hear my voice, says the Lord, and I will free you. Can I just give the invitation? It's such a beautiful time. If you don't know the God of Israel, if you've never committed your life to Christ, You've never crossed over that threshold and said, you know what? I'm going to leave myself behind. I want to sup with the king. I want to be known by him. I want to have covenant with him. You see, when Moses came back, nobody knew he was the last plague. Nobody, there was no ten commandments, ten plagues, excuse me, there was no written scripture that said this is how it's going to go. They didn't know it was their last chance. So what if this is your last chance, says the Lord? What if this is your opportunity? So I want to give you that opportunity. And the way I do it is very simple. We make it way too easy in the Christian church. In the first century, you wanted to be saved, you got in line, you got baptized, you lost your inheritance, you were discontinued, they had a burial service for you. Your parents never spoke your name again. That's why Jesus said, count the cost. If you are that person right now, and you feel that fire inside of you, you feel something, maybe it's hot, maybe you're feeling sweaty, maybe you, you just know you've been walking away from God. If that's you, would you just come down to the front? Just come all the way down to the front. All the way down. We have kneelers down here. Come before your God. Walk over the threshold. If that's you.
if you, the Bible says that if you, if you are ashamed before God, you be ashamed of you when you stand before your Father in heaven. So I just encourage you to just step out of your seat. You know it's you. Just come on down if that's you. Just step out of your seat. Anybody? We're not going to wait long. I just want to make sure. I just want to give the opportunity. If you've never accepted Christ into your life, this is your shot. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. The angels rejoice. Mitzi, you want to come down? Anybody? Our prayer team. Pray over them. Anybody else? Covenant doesn't happen until you step over the threshold. I feel in my spirit that there's two more people. There's two more. God says he knows who you are. You're feeling it. It doesn't matter what the person next to you says. Just, just, just say excuse me and just come on up this is your moment you've been looking forward to this you may not know it but this is your moment if that's you just come on up God loves you every single one of you pray for these people that have chosen to stand out and step out and step over. Father, I just come before you. Just reach out your hand. These are your brothers and sisters that are coming into covenant. These young people, wow. Father, thank you so much for the blood of the covenant. We thank you for the blood of your son. We thank you for the power that you've given us. Lord, I pray in Yeshua's name that you would cast out expose and expunge that you would dip even immerse them into the mikvah of your love and let them come and arise anew come into these young people's hearts let them experience a power let them look back and say this was the moment this was the day this was the time that I made covenant with my king Father, thank you for this absolutely amazing and wonderful night. We ask, God, that this would only be the beginning of an incredible Passover weekend. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for letting us experience you, for we don't deserve you. We ask that you would be with us, protect us, watch over us, and take us past the outer courts, Lord, past the priests who sing your praise take us into the holy of holies. Pull back the curtain of tradition the doctrine of men and let us just go back to the beginning. Upstream where the water is pure. Let your river flow, Father, and let it bring life to everything around it and everyone said, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can we end with a song? All right. Let's end with a song, and then uh, Joseph will come up in just a second. And actually, Joseph, why don't you come up uh, now? Probably easier. And he'll give you some quick instructions, and then you'll be dismissed. Praise God. 
Let's give God a rejoice offering clap, especially for the lives down here that were changed for eternity. Um, a couple minor items. Uh, we jumped the gun a little bit on asking you guys to stay and move the chairs. We need these chairs here for the morning. So we're not moving chairs tonight. You're off the hook for now. We will need help tomorrow. Uh, one more thing I want to mention is that there's some vehicles parked in the tenting area, uh, in the grass, and those do need to be moved to a parking lot or parking area. So there should be some parking by the gym. There should be some parking down by the boat launch, kind of by the lake. Uh, so if you can move those vehicles tonight, be careful. It's dark. Um, but we can't park in the grass by the tenting area. So that is all I have. Uh, we have, obviously, breakfast in the morning, 9.30 with our guest speaker. And is there anything else? Last thing but not least, meet me at the bonfires. Okay? Bonfires. So grab your, your lawn chairs. We're going to be down there in the field hanging out until the Holy Spirit glory fades. Amen. On your way out, grab any garbage that you see, and let's keep this place nice and squeaky clean. Thank you. Everybody have a blessed night. God bless.
The melody you surround me with song of deliverance from my inner. 